Hello everyone, I got 15 jokes for you today. Three old men, best friends since their youth, found themselves living together in a nursing home. They spent their days reminiscing about the good old days and sharing stories of their lives. One afternoon, as they sat in their favorite spot in the common area, they began to discuss their biggest regrets about growing old. The first old man, named George, sighed and said, I'd give anything to take a good, satisfying pee like I did when I was young. Every morning, without fail, I wake up and it takes me a solid five minutes to muster the strength to take a pee. And when I finally do, it's just a small, pitiful dribble. It's such a frustrating start to my day. The second old man, named Fred, nodded sympathetically and added, I'd give anything to take a good dump like I did when I was young. Every single morning, I sit on the porcelain throne, straining and struggling for what feels like hours. Eventually, I can finally push out a little something, but it's hardly the relief I used to experience in my younger days. The third old man, named Harold, listened to his friends and then said, Well, every morning at 5 a.m. sharp, I take a really long, satisfying pee. Then, promptly at 6 a.m., I drop a truly impressive log. It's like clockwork, and I never miss a beat. The other two old men stare at Harold in disbelief, their eyes wide with envy. Finally, George asked, So, what in the world are you complaining about? It sounds like you've got it made. Harold sighed heavily and said, The problem, my friends, is that I don't actually wake up until 7. One sunny afternoon, a diligent police officer was patrolling the city streets when he noticed a suspicious-looking lawyer standing on the sidewalk. The officer decided to approach the lawyer and ask a few questions. As they spoke, the officer couldn't help but notice a strong scent of marijuana coming from the lawyer's pocket. He asked the lawyer to empty his pockets, and sure enough, he found a sizable stash of weed. Sir, you are going to jail for possessing all this marijuana, the officer declared with a stern look. But officer, I assure you, this weed isn't mine. It's truly a mystery. Every time I flush it down the toilet, it somehow reappears in my pocket, the lawyer explained with a nervous smile. The officer, intrigued and slightly amused, decided to challenge the lawyer. Oh really? This I have to see. If you can prove it, you're free to go. Eager to prove his innocence, the lawyer took all the marijuana out of his pocket and put it in a nearby public toilet. He then pulled the handle, watching as the weed swirled down the drain. Both the lawyer and the officer stood by, waiting for something to happen. Several minutes went by, and nothing occurred. The officer, growing impatient, asked, Well, why hasn't the weed reappeared back in your pocket? With an innocent smile on his face, the lawyer replied, What weed? A weary traveler strolls into a dimly lit bar at the end of a long day, seeking some respite and a cold beer. The place is quiet and nearly empty, with only a few patrons scattered around the room. He orders a frosty brew from the bartender, who slides it down the counter with a nod. The man then takes his beer and settles at a cozy table near the back, hoping to relax in solitude. After a few sips, he suddenly hears a tiny voice say, Nice shoes. He glances around, baffled, but the bar is still quiet, and the bartender is busy polishing glasses at the other end. The man shrugs it off, thinking it must have been his imagination, and returns to his beer. A few minutes later, the same small voice pipes up again, nice shirt. The man looks around once more, feeling a bit uneasy, but again, there's no one nearby. He starts to wonder if his mind is playing tricks on him, so he decides to stay alert, listening intently for any further strange occurrences. After a short while, a third tiny voice chimes in, nice pants. Convinced it's not his imagination this time, the man goes up to the bartender and explains the bizarre events that have transpired since he sat down. The bartender chuckles and nods knowingly. Oh, yeah, that happens all the time, he says, gesturing to the small bowl of peanuts on the man's table. Puzzled, the man raises an eyebrow and asks, what do you mean? The bartender grins and replies, it's the peanuts. They're complimentary. After the conclusion of Great Britain's annual beer festival, all the brewery presidents from around the world decided it would be a fantastic idea to continue their celebrations at a local pub in London. 
they agreed to sample some of the best beers the world had to offer. Upon arriving at the historic pub, they found a cozy corner and began placing their orders one by one. The president of a Mexican brewery was the first to speak up, saying, Hey senor, I would like the world's best beer, a Corona por favor. The bartender nodded, carefully dusted off a bottle from the shelf, and handed it to the eager brewery president. Next, the president of an American brewery proudly stated, I'd like the best beer in the world. Give me the king of beers. One Budweiser please. Without hesitation, the bartender grabbed a Budweiser and passed it along. Another brewery president chimed in, I'd like the only beer made with pure Rocky Mountain spring water. Give me a Coors if you please. The bartender smiled, grabbed a Coors, and handed it to the thirsty patron. Finally, it was the turn of the president from Guinness, the world-renowned Irish brewery. To the surprise of everyone, he calmly ordered a Coke. The bartender raised an eyebrow but dutifully provided him with the soft drink. The other brewery presidents exchanged puzzled glances before turning to their colleague from Guinness and asking, Why on earth aren't you drinking a Guinness? The president of Guinness raised his glass of Coke and replied with a sly grin, Well, if you fine gentlemen aren't drinking beer, then neither will I. In the final stages of creating humans, God found himself feeling quite satisfied with his work. As he looked upon Adam and Eve, he realized he had two remaining components left to bestow upon his creations. He was unsure about how to distribute these parts between Adam and Eve, so he decided to consult with them directly. Gathering Adam and Eve before him, God explained, I have two gifts left for you, but you'll have to decide who gets what. The first gift I offer is the ability to urinate while standing up. Adam, without any hesitation, burst out, Oh, please give that to me. I'd absolutely love to have that ability. It seems like the perfect thing for a man to possess. Please, I beg you, give it to me. Adam's excitement resembled that of a little boy who had just been offered his heart's desire. He couldn't contain his enthusiasm, bouncing up and down with anticipation. Eve, on the other hand, remained calm and composed. She smiled at God and said, if Adam truly wants it that much, he can have it. I don't mind. So, God granted Adam the ability to pee while standing up. Adam was absolutely thrilled and wasted no time in exploring his new talent. He began by relieving himself on the side of a rock, and then proceeded to write his name in the sand. Not stopping there, he gleefully performed the helicopter with his newfound ability. Look, Eve, I'm a sprinkler. Adam exclaimed, his laughter echoing through the Garden of Eden. God and Eve observed Adam's antics with amusement, and after a while, God turned to Eve and said, Well, it appears you're left with the final gift I have in store. Curious, Eve inquired, What is it? With a knowing smile, God replied, Brains. In a quaint little village, a sudden flash flood swept over the area, leaving many stranded in their homes. One particular man found himself trapped in his house as the water rapidly rose around him. As the water level continued to rise, a rescue team came by in a boat, hoping to save those in need. Spotting the man, they shouted, Get in! We'll take you to safety! But the man shook his head, his voice steady as he replied, No thank you. I have faith in the Lord. He will save me. Reluctantly, the rescue team moved on, and the rains continued to pour. Soon enough, the man was forced to climb onto his roof to avoid the encroaching water. As he perched on his rooftop, another boat filled with rescuers came into view. They called out to the man, Sir, please get in. The waters are rising, and there's no time to lose. We'll take you to safety. But the man's faith remained unshaken. No, he said again, I have faith in the Lord. He will save me. The rescue boat left with heavy hearts, and the situation grew increasingly dire. The man was now barely able to keep his head above the water as the relentless flood showed no signs of stopping. Seeing the man in grave danger, the authorities dispatched a helicopter to save him. As the helicopter hovered above, the rescuers yelled down to him, We'll lower a rope. Grab on and climb into the helicopter. The water shows no sign of abating, you're certain to drown. Yet again, the man refused. I have faith in the Lord, he said calmly, even as the water lapped at his chin. He will save me. Sadly, the man's faith was not enough to keep him afloat, and he eventually succumbed to the floodwaters. 
Upon arriving in heaven, the man saw the Lord and approached him, a mix of confusion and disappointment in his eyes. What happened? The man asked, his voice wavering. I had faith that you would save me from drowning, but you didn't. The Lord looked at him, a hint of bemusement in his gaze. My child, he replied, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What more did you expect? A man was taking a leisurely stroll along a beautiful California beach. As he walked, he noticed something unusual partially buried in the sand. Curiosity peaked. He picked it up and discovered it was an old, tarnished lamp. He couldn't help but give it a rub, and to his astonishment, out popped a genie. The genie looked somewhat exhausted and impatient, but he spoke to the man. All right, all right, you've released me from the lamp, blah blah blah. But listen, this is the fourth time I've been summoned this month, and I'm getting really tired of granting wishes. So, forget about the traditional three wishes. You only get one, make it count. The man, slightly taken aback by the genie's demeanor, sat down on the sand and thought long and hard about his single wish. Eventually, he said, you know, I've always wanted to visit Hawaii, but I'm terrified of flying and I get horribly seasick. Is there any way you could build me a bridge from California to Hawaii, so I can just drive there whenever I want to visit? The genie burst into laughter and replied, are you kidding me? That's completely impossible. Just think about the logistics involved. How would the support columns ever reach the bottom of the Pacific Ocean? Imagine the amount of concrete and steel it would require. No, no, I'm sorry, but you'll have to come up with another wish. Feeling somewhat deflated, the man sat down again and racked his brain for the perfect wish. After much contemplation, he finally said, Well, I've been married and divorced four times. Each of my ex-wives always told me I was uncaring and insensitive. So, I wish to understand women completely. I want to know how they feel inside, what they're thinking when they give me the silent treatment, why they cry, what they truly desire when they say nothing, and how I can make them genuinely happy. The genie stared at the man for a moment, then sighed and said, You know what? Let's go back to that bridge idea. Do you want it with two lanes or four? A successful dentist decides to treat himself to the best car on the market, a brand new Bugatti Chiron. This incredible car is also the most expensive in the world, with a price tag of $1.5 million. Eager to take his new toy for a spin, he hits the road and eventually stops at a red light. An elderly man on a moped, who appears to be about 90 years old, pulls up next to him. The old man gazes at the sleek, shiny car and curiously asks, what kind of car you got the young fella? The dentist filled with pride, replies, a Bugatti Chiron. It costs one and a half million dollars. Wow, that's a lot of money, says the old man. Why does it cost so much? Because this car can reach speeds of up to 250 miles an hour, boasts the dentist. The moped driver, intrigued, asks, do you mind if I take a look inside? Of course not replies the dentist, eager to show off his prized possession. The old man peers through the window and admires the luxurious interior. After taking it all in, he sits back on his moped and says, It's a mighty fine car, but I think I'll stick with my trusty moped. As the light turns green, the dentist decides to demonstrate the incredible power of his Bugatti to the old man. He floors the accelerator, and within 30 seconds, the speedometer reads 150 miles per hour. Suddenly, he notices a dot in his rearview mirror, growing larger. What could that be, he wonders, as something whizzes by him at an even faster speed. What on earth could be going faster than my Bugatti, the dentist ponders. Determined to find out, he presses the accelerator further and takes the Bugatti up to 175 miles per hour. To his astonishment, he sees that it's the old man on the moped. Unable to believe that the moped could outpace his Bugatti, he gives it more gas and zooms past the moped at 210 miles per hour. Feeling triumphant, he glances in his mirror, only to see the old man gaining on him yet again. Completely astounded by the moped's speed, he floors the gas pedal and takes the Bugatti all the way up to its top speed of 250 miles per hour. However, not even 10 seconds later, he sees the moped rapidly approaching once more. The Bugatti is at its limit, and there's nothing more he can do. In a shocking turn of events, 
The moped slams into the back of the Bugatti, completely wrecking the rear end. The dentist screeches to a halt and jumps out of the car. Miraculously, the old man is still alive. He rushes over to the mangled elderly gentleman and exclaims, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you survived. Is there anything I can do for you? With a weak, raspy voice, the old man whispers, Could you please unhook my suspenders from your side mirror? A group of longtime friends decided to take a weekend trip to Las Vegas, indulging themselves in the city's famed casinos. Among them was a man known for his uncanny luck at games of chance. True to form, he won a whopping $100,000 during their escapades. However, he was a private man and didn't want his friends, or anyone else for that matter, to know about his windfall. So, he made a decision not to return with the rest of his friends, but instead opted to take a later flight home, arriving back in the quiet of his neighborhood at 3 a.m. Stealthily, he went out to the backyard of his suburban home, armed with a shovel. Under the cloak of darkness, he dug a hole and carefully buried his winnings, intending to keep it a secret. As dawn broke, he rose early and stepped outside to check on his hidden treasure. To his horror, all he found was an empty hole. The sight of fresh footprints leading from the hole to the house next door further fueled his panic. His next door neighbor was a deaf mute. Further down the same street lived a college professor who was skilled in sign language and happened to be a friend of the deaf man. Furious and desperate, the man grabbed his pistol and stormed over to the professor's house. Waking him from his slumber, he dragged the professor to the deaf man's house. In a fit of rage, he hollered at the professor, you tell this guy that if he doesn't give me back my $100,000, I'm going to kill him. The professor, frightened but calm, relayed the message to his friend using sign language. The deaf man replied in sign language, I hid it in my backyard, underneath the cherry tree. The professor turned back to the infuriated man with the gun and said, He's refusing to tell you. He said he'd rather die. The Chicago Bears were in desperate need of a new quarterback. The head coach had meticulously assembled the perfect team for the Chicago Bears. The players were strong, agile, and disciplined. The only missing piece was an exceptional quarterback who could guarantee a Super Bowl victory. The coach had searched high and low, scouting college leagues, Canadian leagues, and even European leagues. But he just couldn't find a standout player who could lead the team to glory. One night, as he was watching CNN, he noticed a war zone scene unfolding in Afghanistan. Amid the chaos, he saw a young Afghan Muslim soldier with an extraordinary arm. From a distance, the soldier hurled a hand grenade directly into a 15-story window, 100 yards away. Next, he threw another grenade with pinpoint accuracy into a chimney 75 yards away. Lastly, he managed to throw yet another grenade into a passing car traveling at 90 miles per hour. I've got to get this guy on my team, the coach thought to himself. He has the perfect arm. Determined, the coach brought the young Afghan to the United States and introduced him to the exhilarating game of football. With their new quarterback, the Bears went on to win the Super Bowl. The young Afghan became an instant sensation, hailed as the hero of football. When the coach asked him what he wanted as a reward, the young man simply asked to call his mother. Mom, he said excitedly into the phone, I just won the Super Bowl. I don't want to talk to you, the old Muslim woman replied coldly. You are no longer my son. Mother, I don't think you understand, the young man pleaded. I've just won the most prestigious sporting event in the world, and I'm surrounded by thousands of adoring fans. But his mother was unmoved. No, let me tell you the reality of our situation, she shot back. Our neighborhood is in ruins, with gunshots ringing out constantly. Your two brothers were severely beaten last week, and I have to keep your sister hidden in the house to protect her from being assaulted. The old woman paused, choking back tears, and said bitterly, I will never forgive you for making us move to Chicago. A blonde woman was excited to start her new job as a physical education teacher for a group of 16-year-olds. On her first day, she noticed a boy standing alone at the end of the field, while all the other students were running around, laughing and kicking a soccer ball. Concerned, she decided to approach the boy to make sure he was okay. Are you alright? She asked kindly. Yes, the boy replied. You know, you can join the other kids and play soccer with them, the teacher suggested. No, 
It's probably better if I stay here, the boy responded. Puzzled, the blonde teacher asked. Why do you think that, sweetie? The boy looked at her in disbelief and said, Because I'm the goalie. As a job interview was coming to an end, the human resources manager asked a young, ambitious engineer who had just graduated from MIT. So, what starting salary were you hoping for? The young engineer confidently replied, I'm looking for something in the range of $225,000 a year, depending on the benefits package, of course. The interviewer raised an eyebrow and said, Well, how about a package that includes five weeks of vacation, 14 paid holidays, comprehensive medical and dental coverage, a company matching retirement fund up to 50% of your salary, and a brand new company car at least every two years, let's say a stunning red Corvette. The engineer's eyes widened, and he sat up straight in his chair, exclaiming, Wow, that's incredible. Are you serious? With a smirk, the interviewer responded, No, not really, but you started it. The members of the Anjanang First Nation Reservation were curious about the upcoming winter, so they asked their new chief whether it would be cold or mild. Since he was a chief in a modern society, he had never been taught the old secrets. When he looked at the sky, he couldn't discern any signs that would indicate what the winter would be like. Nevertheless, to be on the safe side, he told his tribe that the winter was indeed going to be cold and that the members of the village should collect firewood to be prepared. But, being a practical leader, after several days of pondering, he came up with an idea. He went to the nearest phone booth, dialed the Canadian Weather Service and asked, Is the coming winter going to be cold? It appears this winter is going to be quite cold. The meteorologist at the Weather Service responded. So the chief went back to his people and told them to collect even more firewood to ensure they would be prepared. A week later, still feeling uncertain, he called the Canadian Weather Service again. Does it still look like it is going to be a very cold winter? Yes, the man at Weather Service replied, it's going to be a very cold winter indeed. The chief again went back to his people and ordered them to collect every last bit of firewood they could find to be absolutely certain they would be ready. Two weeks later, the chief called the Canadian Weather Service one more time. Are you absolutely sure that the winter is going to be very cold? Without a doubt, the man replied. It's looking more and more like it's going to be one of the coldest winters we've ever experienced. How can you be so sure? The chief asked, puzzled. The weatherman replied, It's quite simple really. The Indians are collecting an astonishing amount of firewood. A group of men were in the spacious locker room of a prestigious golf club. They were all enjoying the camaraderie and relaxation that comes after a satisfying round of golf. A variety of conversations filled the room. Discussions about the course, debates about golfing techniques, and chit-chat about life in general. Suddenly, a cell phone resting on a bench in the middle of the room rang, disrupting the laid-back atmosphere. One of the men, a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman, walked over to the phone and casually put it on speaker, deciding to answer the call as he continued to lace up his golf shoes. As he began to speak, the general hum of conversation in the room gradually died down, one by one, the other men in the locker room turned their attention to the unfolding conversation, their curiosity peaked. Man, hello? Woman, hi, darling, it's me. Are you at the club? Man, yes, I am. The woman on the other end of the line sounded excited as she continued, I'm at the shopping mall right now, and I found this absolutely stunning leather coat. It's a steal at only $1,200, marked down from $1,900. Is it okay if I buy it? Without hesitation, the man replied, Sure, go ahead if you like it that much. The woman sounded thrilled as she said, Oh, thank you so much. I also stopped by the Mercedes dealership this morning and saw the new models. There was one in particular that I really, really fell in love with. The man, still nonchalant, asked, How much? The woman responded, It's $80,000. Again, without flinching, the man said, okay, but for that price I want it with all the optional extras. The woman sounded like she was over the moon as she said, oh, that's fantastic, and there's just one more thing. Remember the house we looked at and loved last year? It's back on the market, they're asking $1,500,000. The man casually replied, well then, go ahead and make them an offer, 
but don't go higher than 1,250,000. The woman could hardly contain her excitement as she said, Wow, you're the best. I'll see you later. I love you so much. The man responded warmly, Love you too, bye. The man hung up the call, the room returning to silence. The other men in the locker room were looking at him in absolute astonishment, their jaws practically on the floor. Then the man looked around the room, smiled casually, and asked, Anyone know whose phone this is? A seasoned hunter embarks on a thrilling safari expedition with his wife and his mother-in-law, hoping to create some unforgettable memories together. One morning during their adventure, the wife wakes up to find her mother missing from their camp. Anxiety surges through her, and she urgently wakes her husband. Together, they set off on a desperate search to locate the elderly woman. As they navigate through the dense wilderness, following faint tracks and listening for any signs of her presence, they suddenly come across a small clearing. To their shock and disbelief, they see the mother-in-law standing face to face with a ferocious lion. Quick darling, the wife cries out in panic, you have to do something. However, the husband, with an unexpectedly calm demeanor, responds, that lion got himself into this mess, let him get himself out, 